little bit of confusion about the schedule, so um, my talk was moved here. This is my talk. It's data storage, subtitled NoSQL Toasters and a Cloud of Kitchen Sinks. I am Casey Rosenthal. And I work for a company called Basho. Basho makes a distributed uh, key value database called React. It's very ops friendly, and they have a product called React CS, which is kind of like private S3. So there's a joke in uh, the NoSQL world that goes something like this. Uh, it's a bad joke, I'll preface it with that. Do you have a toaster? Yeah, I have a toaster. Everybody has a toaster, right? Does your toaster run SQL? Um, no, my toaster doesn't run SQL. Oh, so you must have one of those newfangled NoSQL toasters. Here's a newfangled NoSQL toaster. Now, the joke's uh, bad because it's absurd. And it's absurd because this term NoSQL is absurd, right? We're, we're in an industry. We're literally, you know, it's software. We can compute anything given enough time and resources. And we define this, this industry, NoSQL, by this small thing that it can't do which just happens to leave everything else that's possible. So if you're in my field, if you're in NoSQL, um, this is kind of a problem, but you know, this is how we're known. We're all known under the NoSQL umbrella, so we have to embrace that. We have to find a way to embrace the term NoSQL. How do we do that? Well, first we recognize it's just a term, and then we imbue it with our, with our own meaning. So for us, NoSQL means uh, choices. We want it to be an analog with choices in how you store your data. For the past few decades, prior to the NoSQL emergence, we essentially had, as software engineers, we essentially had two ways to store data, on a file system or in a relational database. And what's exciting about working in this world is every year, every couple months, a new NoSQL database comes out. New applications are built in ways that access data in different, uh, different ways. And so as software engineers, we now have more tools to solve more problems to build uh, new solutions. So why NoSQL? This is going to be the overarching theme of my talk. Why NoSQL? Why would you want to look at uh, NoSQL uh, for any reason other than uh, curiosity's sake? Uh, I'm going to break the talk up into basically three parts. Who, who are the NoSQL players? Uh, what kind of things are, what kind of problems are NoSQL solving? And how do we build applications on top of um, NoSQL databases? Obviously, I only have 40 minutes, so I'm just going to be scratching the surface on uh, all of these. And uh, I want everyone to be aware that uh, I do work for a NoSQL company, Basho which makes a NoSQL product, React. So obviously, I have a certain bias. Um, it would be really easy to stand up here and start flame wars by criticizing other NoSQL databases. And since I work with React, I'm very aware of uh, criticisms uh, about React. In order to avoid those flame wars, as fun as they might be for some people, uh, I'm going to attempt to only say positive things about NoSQL databases. Okay. So in this primer to the NoSQL world, I'm going to do my best to only say uh, positive things about the other databases. If you want a critical anal uh, analysis of some of the options up here, talk to me after the talk or in another forum. This is a chart that uh, 451 Research put out. It's uh, the NoSQL LinkedIn Skills Index. So people on LinkedIn, they have their profiles. They can say what uh, database skills they have. And then they summed them. And so going from uh, left to right, we can see the most popular NoSQL databases self-described by the engineers who allegedly have skills in these databases. That's a little bit hard to see, so I'll zoom in. And we'll take the first half of the chart. So over here, we have MongoDB, Redis, Cassandra, HBase, CouchDB, MarkLogic, Neo4j, React, CouchBase, and DynamoDB. I'm going to very uh, quickly go over uh, these 10 databases. Obviously, I can't get into any depth with, with any of the 10. And somebody somewhere once said something about constraints give you freedom or something to that effect. So I'm going to constrain myself to a single slide 
taken from GitHub for a Ruby client for one of these databases to prove to you that, yes, people are using these databases. And I'll briefly describe some of the, the properties. So if we go in order, MongoDB. I don't, again, I don't expect you to learn how to use MongoDB. All you're seeing from this example is, yes, people write Ruby apps on top of MongoDB. So MongoDB is a document uh, database storage engine. A document is a uh, data structure that you can think of as kind of like a tree where uh, each node is a key value pair. And the value might just be a set of other branches, right? So you've got this branching structure. Most of us, this is uh, Rails world, right? Most of us are familiar with uh, documents uh, via the DOM or uh, regular old HTML. So you nested elements, all of that stuff, that's a document. MongoDB stores uh, its documents in a binary uh, safe version of JSON. So the documents look very similar to JSON. Next one on that list was Redis. Redis is an in-memory, it stores stuff just in, in RAM, uh, storage uh, key value has a couple other data types, but primarily it's known as a key value, and it, it can persist to disk, but again, it serves requests out of memory. Cassandra, Cassandra falls in the um, column family group of NoSQL databases. Uh, so inspired by Bigtable, these NoSQL databases, um, they don't have a, a relational structure of tables, columns, and rows. Um, they, they have a different structure for column, families, columns, and uh, records. And the implication here is that uh, these store the data on disk differently than a relational database would store data. So in a relational database, for example, it would be really awkward to have a data model where you have a table with a lot of columns and only one value uh, set for a given record. Right? Sparse data like that is kind of inefficient in most relational databases. Sparse data happens to be very efficient in uh, column family um, storage uh, paradigm. HBase, the next one on here, is also a uh, column family storage uh, NoSQL database, although uh, on the back end it distributes the data much differently. You can access the data kind of in a similar par paradigm uh, to Cassandra. And some descriptions I've seen for HBase describe it as a large hash map. CouchDB. CouchDB is another document database. It stores its documents in JSON, and you can use MapReduce to define different views of those documents. MarkLogic, yet another document database. This one stores its documents in XML. Neo4j, uh, this is the first uh, graph database on this list. So if you've ever tried to model a tree structure or a hierarchy in a relational database, something where you would want to um, recurse through records to get the full structure out if it's properly normalized, you might have seen that in a relational database that's kind of a pain. Well, graph databases are specifically designed to make those kinds of relations easy to navigate and efficient to navigate, right? Self-joining a table in SQL would probably not be a, a good idea. You'd run into uh, resource limits pretty quickly that way, if you, depending on how deep you went to, to pull out that relationship. But graph databases are specifically designed to do that, to traverse those kinds of uh, data structures efficiently. React is uh, a distributed key value uh, store, so like, um, uh, like the other key values, React has no intrinsic knowledge about the value that it stores. You could store JSON in here, or XML, or binaries. It doesn't really uh, care. Couchbase, you can kind of think of that as a mashup between an in-memory uh, key value and a persisted uh, JSON document store. And Amazon Dino, DynamoDB. This is a, yet another key value, distributed uh, key value database. OK, so there's the top 10. So in the back of your mind, uh, you, you can now say um, you know, you're, you're basically familiar 
with the scene. What I want you to get out of that is if you haven't seen these names before, now you have, and maybe when a use case comes up uh, that could make use of one of these, you can go, okay, I kind of know something about what that does. Um, or just go ahead and put NoSQL on your LinkedIn uh, profile. <laughs> the burden of being popular. So one of the reasons that NoSQL emerged is because uh, SQL was maybe too popular. It was being used in places where it wasn't an ideal fit. So I don't want you to, I don't want to leave you with just those top 10, right? There are, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of NoSQL databases that solve different problems in unique ways. And a lot of those benefits, um, you kind of just have to be exposed to, to really get them. So I'm just going to pick uh, three that I happen to be looking at this past month just to illustrate the depth of solutions that NoSQL databases can address. So the first is Titan. This is another graph database like Neo4j. What's interesting to me about this is it's distributed. So if you have more data than fits on one machine, uh, this might be an option. It's eventually consistent. Uh, it's still in alpha. I think it's at uh, 0.3. To prove it's real, you can get the, it's a job app. You can uh, you know, install it via Maven or whatever there. And it uses uh, Gremlin, which is like a query, it's a query language for uh, graph databases uh, that Neo4j also supports. Um, it actually runs on top of, Titan actually uses uh, Cassandra or HBase uh, as its storage mechanism. So that's kind of interesting. Another one, ExistDB. So Titan is, is relatively new. ExistDB has been around for a while, since 2001. Like MarkLogic, it stores files in XML. What I think is cool about this is it uses a query language called XQuery. Here's an example. It might be too dark to see on the screen, but again, this is taken from their example page. So XQuery is a W3C standard language, and it's kind of cool because it combines XPath with a JavaScript ish, a JavaScript-like language, and XML inside. So you can use this language to generate a query that actually outputs an HTML file. And I think that's kind of cool. So you, you put the, the data in as XML files, and when you change those, the queries will update their view, and you can essentially serve web pages directly from this database. Okay, so imagine if you had a dynamic RSS feed or some sort of web page search engine that wasn't too complicated, you could use XPath to get the data out of there and populate an RSS feed directly from the database. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool. And Datomic. So Datomic is really interesting. Remember, and this is a Rails community, so we assumed some things about our application architecture in order to benefit from uh, the structure of a Rails application. Datomic does something similar. It makes a couple of assumptions, for example, about your hardware and about your use case, to give you, a, as in my experience, a unique uh, uh, feature set for a database. So basically, it, it runs a peer inside of your application that kind of has like a built-in caching for queries, gives you consistent transactions, and time-based facts, they call them, that actually return as native data types, so like an array in Ruby. I'm not going to say uh, too much more about Datomic uh, because uh, 10.30 Thursday morning, uh, Yoko Harada is going to be talking about Datomic and Ruby. So I'm looking forward to that talk. But again, with this, I just wanted to kind of you know, illustrate that, OK, we've got our, our top 10 NoSQL databases. Obviously, those aren't even close as popular as the SQL solutions we're used to. But this field is, is large. It's exciting. It's, um, it's got uh, energy in it. In Rails, right? In Rails 4.0, Rails 5.0, it's a mature framework. We're not going to get any huge surprises from future versions of Rails. But in the NoSQL world, we are going to get uh, new solutions that solve problems in ways that we haven't thought of before. So getting back to why NoSQL. One reason you might want to choose or investigate a NoSQL uh, solution is for fault tolerance. So I think of fault tolerance as the optimistic view 
that bad stuff is going to happen. Right? The optimistic view that bad stuff is going to happen. Your hard disk, the bearings on your hard disk are going to break. Your SSD is going to break. Your server is going to die. Network cable is going to come unplugged. This stuff happens. So if you have an application, a business use case, where your database, your data storage has to be fault tolerant, then you might want to look at a NoSQL solution that is specifically designed from the ground up to provide fault tolerance. If you, if you try to build fault tolerance on top of the relational databases that we're used to, it can be done to a degree, but it's kind of a pain in, it's a pain, right? So some databases will automatically distribute the data for you to multiple nodes so that you have multiple copies of it. It'll automatically uh, route around the drunk puppies in your cluster. And when you, know, you get a fresh uh, node in your cluster, it'll automatically heal the data by sending the data to that. Fault tolerance is uh, a really important uh, attribute to have in a data store. And so if the, your use case calls for that, you definitely want to start with a database that's specifically designed to meet that criteria. I'll ta let's take a look at another one, high availability. In uh, distributed databases, we love to do things in parallel. So here is a parallel cluster of napping puppies. We'll call this the napping puppy database. I won't trademark that, so if any of you want to go build this, that's cool. All right, so if we store a, a, a value into our napping puppy cluster, say we're storing orange, and we get that, we ask for that data value back out from a different puppy, as long as the cluster's all talking to each other, we'll get the answer that we expect, orange. But puppies don't always talk to each other, so say we have a division there, right? This could be a network partition, um, could be just a, a node on your server is, is down. It doesn't matter. All you know is that from one part of your distributed network, you can now no longer communicate with the other part of your distributed network. So what do you do? When in a highly available system, if you can, can, the part that you can connect to, you can still save a value. So you can save uh, this value as yellow. And when you retrieve it from that side, you'll get yellow. And you can't see this bottom part, right? But from the other side, if you can see the bottom part but not the top part, you can go ahead and save the same value, blue, right? You read it back out and you get that value. But notice that if this happened at the same time, depending on where you were uh, connected to, you're getting a different answer. In a lot of use cases, a lot more use cases than I originally thought when, before I was in the NoSQL arena, this is acceptable. In fact, the preferred way for an application to respond. If you're only connected to a subset of a distributed network, a lot of times it's more important to get a response, any response, than the correct response, whatever that means. Right? So in, web, in anything web-related, this is, this is usually the response that we want. Usually we want a web page even if it's outdated, even if it doesn't agree with the same web page that somebody would view from the other side of the country. And then, of course, when that partition goes away, a highly available data store will have some method to allow you to resolve um, that value. In this case, we took yellow and blue and got green. That's one property. So if you have, if you have a use case for high availability, again, that's, that's difficult to do with a SQL database, with a relational database. But some of the NoSQL databases are specifically designed for this. So here's another one. So here's a flock of penguins database, right? And these guys stick together. I can't draw a line between them. So in some cases, you want strict consistency over a cluster, over a large cluster. Again, if you do this in a traditional relational database, you're going to be dealing with locking or some other mechanism that's going to affect performance. So in consistency, we, we uh, write to this guy. And then when we go to fetch that data, they will all, whatever answer they give, they will all give the same answer. The state of the data at any given time is identical in a strongly consistent database. So some NoSQL databases were specifically designed to do this, to have strong consistency over a, a distributed data set. That's not an easy problem to solve, and it's, and it's certainly not easy to do with the relational tools that we have. 
and scale, everybody's favorite um, NoSQL topic, scale. So a word about scale. You can scale throughput, like operations per second. Um, you can scale storage, the amount of disk space that you're storing stuff on. Uh, latency, scaling latency is probably more important. If you can do a million operations uh, average per second, but it's taking you a minute from when the query starts to when the query ends, that's not going to be acceptable for a web page, right? So latency is, is actually a really important thing to consider when you're looking at scaling. Scaling uh, takes two forms, vertical. You put something on a bigger machine. And this was uh, formerly the typical way, the prototypical way, to scale a SQL database, right? You just put it on a bigger box. Horizontal means you distribute the workload among uh, many machines. And this is very appealing on commodity hardware. It can be done on a rela relational database. You can, do, you can use tricks like sharding, but then uh, you know, there, ha there have to be certain things about your application logic that can't change in order for that to trans transition smoothly. Some databases, uh, some of the NoSQL databases that scale take the strategy of using uh, separate servers that handle different tasks. So like one will handle the metadata and the other will handle the actual storage and so you can query a transactor or something like that and distribute the workload among many storage nodes that way. The other kind of paradigm for having a scalable NoSQL database is to have some sort of logical um, data locality. So like a, you use a consistent hash so that logically when the transaction comes in you know which server it lands on and that way you can just add more servers to scale out. But again, so this is the, the third reason you might want to look at a NoSQL database instead of a relational database. And just to really hammer home this uh, scaling issue, I came across this yesterday. 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years. We're kind of at an inflection point on an exponential curve for data storage. Last year, uh, we, the sources estimate that we, we stored about two, and a half, two to two and a half zettabytes of data. So, so it goes uh, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte. So it's, it's just an unconceivably large amount of data. And my napkin math tells me that in 2013, we're going to store more, data, more than that, a lot more than that, more data than has ever been stored up until 2013. Okay? That's just the data that we're storing. There's a bigger problem, which is we don't have the infrastructure to store all of the data that we have a business case for storing. So people want to store data that we simply can't. And relational databases certainly aren't going to scale in to meet that demand. No SQL databases are struggling to scale to, to get in there to meet that demand. If you're a software engineer or a consultant, and you have insight into how NoSQL works and how these databases scale out, that makes you really valuable because there are very few people who can solve that problem. So again, why NoSQL? Well, I'm here to tell you that there is no Todd. There's no universal theory of data. You may have picked up on this by now. There's no one database that you can go to and say, okay, this is it. And there's no universal theory, theory above that that you can say, OK, this is the application that I have. Now, which NoSQL database is the right one for me? There's no answer to that yet. It's, it's not yet a solved problem. So we have to go on experience and intuition. And again, as a software engineer, if you have that, that's really valuable. But there are access patterns. So in trying to figure out how we work with uh, NoSQL databases. I'm, I'm the uh, director of professional services at, at uh, Basho. So we go on site with big clients and we help them figure out how to uh, install this infrastructure to store uh, these mountains of data that uh, people are creating, that businesses are creating now. And so we need some sort of framework for deciding, OK, what is the best uh, uh, tool for the job? And we started by developing this framework around access patterns. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of access patterns. So say we have um, a scale. On one side is scheduled, on the other spontaneous. We're looking at the query patterns between an application and a data store. So 
on one side scheduled. You can think of something on a cron job or if you're able to negotiate with a stakeholder and say, I'm going to run this report at uh, you know, 4 a.m. on Sunday. On the other side of the scale, you have spontaneous. The quintessential example here is a website. Right? You don't have control, you don't have explicit control over when people visit your website. And that might trigger a query. Right? Scheduled versus spontaneous. Here's, an, here's another scale. It's static versus dynamic. On the static side, think of um, a key value. It's like, I want this, OK, and it, the database just gives it right back to you. If you can trace exactly the path of, that the code follows to retrieve the data that you want, that's pretty static. On the other side, we have dynamic. Anything that requires a query planner is dynamic. If you can't beforehand, before the query is, is issued, know with certainty how it's going to go through the stack to retrieve the data, then it's dynamic. Okay, So that's static and dynamic. Put these two together, you get a nice grid here. Along the top, we have static and dynamic. And on the left side, we have spontaneous and scheduled. And it turns out if we can fit an application into its access pattern into one of these quadrants, then that helps us begin to think about what NoSQL solutions or relational solutions, what data storage solutions uh, are appropriate for the access pattern. So if we look at the first one, well, pretty much every database worth its salt can handle this, right? A static fetch scheduled. It's very easy to plan for. It's very easy to control for the resources you would need for that. Spontaneous and static, not everyone can do this. Databases that scale well can do this better than databases that don't. Key values are static. So a key value that scales well is going to be really good at spontaneous static queries. Get a little bit more difficult, dynamic and scheduled. OK, so some databases have ways to uh, you know, dig into the data a little bit deeper, MapReduce or um, uh, CQL or SQL or uh, one of the other querying languages. And if it's scheduled, again, you can control for resources. The problem is this quadrant where you don't know when that query is going to be generated, and you don't know how that query is going to be executed. Now, having grown up in a relational world, we already kind of sort of have best practices in hand, so we know we're not supposed to join you know, the table to itself a million times. Right? That's going to utilize a lot of resources. Stuff's going to crash. Most databases are happy in one of those three. They have some method of reasonably handling those three. And they're not so good down here in the, in the spontaneous dynamic realm. So what do we do when it's down in this realm? So in this lower um, right-hand quadrant, as application developers, that happens to be where we usually start thinking about our application in terms of the data storage. So that's kind of an unfortunate mismatch. So when we come in. We say, OK, we want to fix that. What do we do? Well, we try to take the use case and move it from there over to, um, from dynamic over to static. How do we do that? Well, we want to evolute how we, uh, right? We don't want to evolve how we deal with data. We don't want to just randomly do stuff and see what survives. We want to proactively evolute ourselves. I totally made up that word. So we want to actively go, OK, this is how uh, that we originally thought about the application in terms of uh, you know, it's got some dynamic query pro uh, access pattern. Can we make that access pattern static? Because if we can, then we can move it over to one of the, the NoSQL databases that handles scaling a lot better, and we can still solve that problem. And it's a different mindset. It's a, it's a change in how you view software engineering. So I'm going to describe a prototypical uh, relational scenario. Feel free to disagree with me, but this was, <laughs> this was how I was raised. Um, in a SQL, if you have a relational uh, data model and you're looking at a new application, OK, so first thing you figure out is what data do I have to store? And you take that data and you break it down in a data model, and you normalize it, you make sure all of the relationships are correct, and there's a lot of uh, best practices for that. And as long as you model the data properly, then when you go to build the application on top of it, the view, you have a fair degree of confidence 
a fair degree of certainty that you'll be able to query what you need out of that solid data model. So data model first, and then worry about querying later. But don't worry about it too much, because if you do the first part well, then the second part, um, you have some confidence that that'll work. When dealing with NoSQL, particularly some of the simpler data structures like key value, you want to flip that. You want to start with, what do I want this data to look like? And if you solve that well, then the data model actually just falls out. So you solve this part well, this is the report I want, this is the web page I want, this is the view of the data that I want. Then how to store it in the, in the back end actually just falls out because you want it to look exactly the way you want it to fe the way you want to fetch it. Okay? And then you're not interested in normalizing data because that just takes extra time. So most applications that I've seen, it's actually uh, it's an exercise, but it's reasonable and rational to take what you thought was a dynamic access pattern and convert it into a static one. And then you get the benefits of having that spontaneous static uh, solution backing your formerly dynamic access pattern. An example of this is say you have a report, uh, say you're looking at like users and logs or something, and you want to know how many users hit this web page. Well, we all know how to do that in SQL. You would just count on a column or average or something, whatever statistic you want. Well, how would you do that in a key value database? Well, you can't do it that way. So instead, every time a log file is written, um, write out to the solution. Keep a rolling average. Keep a rolling count. Do it in real time. You've just distributed uh, your writes across time. And so particularly in a heavy, uh, read-heavy application, you've just saved yourself a lot of uh, processing time. You've saved all of the query planning because now you don't have any query planning. You just fetch the answer. It doesn't get any faster than that. And that kind of uh, architecture is really easy to scale. If that fails, go with a hybrid solution. I've seen some really awesome hybrid solutions. Right? One, of my, one of my favorite uh, hybrid solutions is like Postgres for metadata, and then it spits out a key, and then you use the key uh, to fetch uh, value out of you know, one of the key values like uh, React. OK? But again, there is no universal theory of data right now. So this is where experience and intuition really have to um, trump any heuristic, because we don't have a heuristic. So if you want to remain, uh, if you want to be particularly valuable in software engineering right now, experiencing, gaining experience with these different NoSQL databases is uh, a really good way to do that. And even though there's no theory of data, universal theory of data, uh, as software engineers, I promise you, we can still find harmony with all these different uh, species of databases. It is, uh, can be a little bit confusing, but it is certainly uh, doable. Okay, and hopefully I have time for some questions, although I'm not sure what the format for that is. That's my talk. I'm Casey Rosenthal.